on a on a rainy Saturday in Oct in October. Uh, thrilled that you all came out uh, to be part of our symposium on Esther and, and James Jackson. Uh, I know everybody doesn't have seats. We're, we actually have additional uh, additional seating, and we'll be setting. Uh, setting them up in a, uh, in a, in a few minutes, uh, so bear, bear with us. Uh, uh, our objectives today are threefold in, in, in this day-long symposium. Uh, we, uh, we're here to recognize the central role that James and Esther Jackson played in the struggle for social justice and their roles on the American left. Our second objective is to explore these contributions within the context of the growing historical literature on, on, the, on this subject. And, and, and many of the people who you're going to be hearing from today have, have written extensively just in this area. Uh, and third, uh, we want to announce the opening of the James and Jester Jackson papers that were entrusted to the Tenement Library early this year and will be officially open, we're predicting, in, uh, in January. Uh, we hope that this conference will give you a preview of what is in this very important research collection and the ways it will, in which it will open up new ways of studying and thinking about the civil rights movement and the American left. Most of our uh, program are going to be devoted, is going to be devoted to the first and second objectives that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So I'd like to take uh, my time to talk about the archive uh, and, and why I think it is one of the most important collections that the Tavement Library has acquired in recent years and certainly since I've been here. I also want to mention uh, in, in this context that this past summer, Tamament, uh brought, uh, acquired the library of the Reference Center for Marxist Studies and the Archives of the Communist Party USA. And obviously, these collections and the Jackson collection speak to each other. Sam Webb, I'm thrilled, is, is here with us today, and he was instrumental in uh, facilitating this acquisition. So Sam, I want to thank you for that. Uh, I, uh, I, I think researchers clearly will use these collections uh, in, in, in tandem because of the way they speak to each other. When the Jacksons first invited me to their apartment in Brooklyn uh, about a year ago uh, to survey their papers and talk to them about the possibility of them coming to Tamament, uh, the first thing that I noticed was the files relating to the Southern Negro Youth Congress dating from the er late 1930s and early 1940s. What I immediately recognized when I looked uh, through these boxes, which were in Jim and Esther's bedroom and underneath the bed and in the, and in the closet, uh, that they could lead to a complete reassessment of the way historians think about the origins of the civil rights movement. As Esther and I have discussed many times over the past year as we've gotten to know each other, uh, historians still tend to see the origins of the civil rights movement in the 1950s, uh, or perhaps beginning after the war, World War II, and the fights over uh, uh, desegregation. Some scholars uh, do recognize that the roots of the civil rights movement go back to World War II and the struggles to desegregate the armed forces and obviously the fighting for the fair employment practices uh, to in integrate the defense industries. What the Jackson papers make, uh, make clear is really we need to think uh, about the, pre the, the previous decade, the 1930s. Uh, as Robert Corstead, from who you'll be hearing with, from later this morning, has told us, the civil rights movement in the 1930s was in many respects rooted in the struggle of African-American working, uh, working people against e economic exploitation. And the struggle against Jim Crow and, e and for economic justice were inextricably connected uh, during that uh, decade and, and the 1940s. Uh, James Jackson, as I'm sure you all know, was a founding member of the Southern Negro Youth Congress and attended its first co convention in Richmond in 1937. 
after having worked as a research assistant for Gunnar Merdrell on the uh, American Dilemma project. And on the an side, uh, many of James's research notes and correspondence uh, describing his investigation in, into uh, you know, Jim Crow practices and racial attitudes during that project are actually uh, part of the archive and one of the real exciting pieces of this archive. Uh, James Jackson soon became educational director of the Southern Negro Youth Congress and in, in 1940 was named head of the Right to Vote campaign. And as you could see in the exhibit cases in the back, many of the manifestos, proclamations, and pamphlets uh, uh, that were written for the Southern Negro Youth Congress uh, were, were written, by, uh, written by James Jackson. Uh, Esther Jackson attended her first SNYC convention in 1939. I hope I have that right now. Uh, I, I always get confused whether it's 1939 or 1940. After having completed a master's degree at Fisk University, uh, she had been accepted into a PhD program at the University of Chicago, but chose the SNYC in activism instead of the academy, and I don't think ever looked back. But by, by the early 1940s, es Esther uh, had, had, had succeeded Ed Strong as executive director of the SNYC, which again I think is, is remarkable given the attitudes even on the left about the role of women in activist organizations in the, in the, 19, in the 1940s. I really do think that's a, a remarkable accomplishment and clearly reflected uh, everybody's respect uh, for uh, what Esther could do. Uh, what, what the Jackson papers show uh, is, is what Robert Corstead has called us, called civil rights unionism, extended throughout the entire South in the 1930s. Uh, I discovered again uh, that first day when I was looking at the papers in uh, James and Esther's closet, that the very first convention of the Southern Negro Youth Congress, there were 534 delegates, and uh, they represented, uh, and I'll, I, need, I, I had to do a double take when I saw that, uh, tw uh, uh, 250,000 uh, young people. Uh, who uh, were involved in SNYC activities in some form in 1937. Again, a, a, a figure that I really find stunning. And it was not only students. Uh, there, were, uh, there were a core of students, but they were uh, tobacco workers, coal miners, steel workers from Birmingham, textile workers from South Carolina, dock workers from New Orleans, uh, sharecroppers from all over the South. And even uh, uh, some chain gang uh, people representing some, some of the people who were uh, serving time in the chain gang. And there was also a, 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 con a, con a contingent representing dom uh, domestic workers. So you really had a, a group here at that very first convention uh, representing the broad spectrum of the African-American working class and also uh, the, uh, the, 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 young, the, the young students. Uh, in, 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 in the 1930s, uh, these uh, working class trade unionists uh, and college educated young people uh, really formed an alliance within the SNYC uh, to fight for both industrial unionism and uh, to resist the Jim Crow system and, uh, and, and its exploitive labor system. Uh, uh, the, the other uh, thing that I really found fascinating, uh, that the SNYC's first major victory, first major campaign, was to work with the uh, Virginia tobacco stemmers to organize their, uh, their first industrial union. And uh, surprisingly, for the South of 1937, uh, thir uh, or maybe this is 38, 39, uh, they succeeded uh, beyond, I think, anybody's expectation. Uh, by, uh, by, by 1939, they uh, had conducted eight successful strikes and uh, uh, really had, 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 had uh, t taken control of 
the Tobacco Workers Union from the old AFL uh, Tobacco Workers in, in Industrial Union. Again, this, uh, this was a, a, an early example of the, of, of the Communist Party's uh, success with the, uh, the tra trade, trade Union Unity League. So it, uh, uh, and you know, and working with the Southern Negro Youth Congress again, it's a story that I, I I knew absolutely nothing about until that that day in Esther and James' bedroom. Uh, the, the the Jackson papers obviously remind us all how important, which uh, the largely forgotten, uh, unfortunately so, the Southern Negro Youth Congress is, and and how it really began the modern fight against Jim Crow as a campaign uh, against lynching, police rep uh, repression, and for workers' rights, and to challenge, uh, really for the, for the first time, I think, since Reconstruction, even though some people, I suspect, will debate uh, me about this, the, uh, the system of, 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 of racial segregation. Uh, as, as, as Robin Kelly has, has shown, and, and one of the, uh, you know, if you recall one of his la the last chapters on, on race rebels, he really makes the connection between the Southern Negro Youth Congress and, and the civil rights movement of the, of, of the 1930s by showing that in some of the same uh, counties, particularly in Alabama and Mississippi, where the Southern Negro Youth Congress was active, uh, were really the very same places that saw the rebirth of the civil rights movement uh, uh, 30 years later. And that historical memory clearly despite uh, all the re all the repression and segregation had been kept alive over the over that th uh, 30 years uh, you know you know clearly uh, uh, what what we see is that the SNYC's organizing campaigns of the 1930s and 40s were a crucial watershed in the 20th century civil rights movement and fight for social justice. It taught a generation of, of, of activists that came of age in the 1930s that the struggles over class and race were inseparable and how important it was to link the African-American freedom struggle to the American left and the possibilities and, and also challenges, certainly, of building a class and interracial alliances. Perhaps this is why so many of the Southern Negro Youth uh, Congress uh, young activists eventually did uh, come to affiliate themselves with the Communist Party and, and, the, and the CIO. Uh, in this respect, uh, the movement uh, appears to have been very different uh, the movement of the 30s appears to have been very different from the 1960s. Uh, the, the, the 1930s movement was clearly more of a class based movement, uh, student worker alliance, uh, for sure. While the 1960s movement, and I know this is broad, uh, broad generalizations that people are probably going uh, to take issue with, uh, was uh, more middle class based and, and, and centered on the African American churches. Uh, even though uh, I, I actually listened to the oral history interview that Robin Kelly did with Esther 20 years ago, uh, and we, if we have time, I, it's, it's actually on the recorder, I'm going to play a, a couple of snips later this morning, perhaps right before lunch. But actually, after listening to that oral history interview, I, I, uh, I began to at least somewhat reevaluate the statement that I, I just made, because one of the things that Esther does point out, that it, uh, in the 1930s, even the, uh, the young activists that were uh, you know, imbued with the class struggle, did recognize that in order to organize in the African American community, they had to work through the African American churches, and that they uh, did uh, build bridges to the churches and to the ministers. So that generalization, e even I may take back after at least part of it after listening to that oral history and. Uh, 
interviews. But, but certainly the Jackson papers give us a way of thinking about the differences and some of the similarities and the, uh, the disjunctures and the continuities between from uh, the civil rights movement to the 1930s and 1940s to the 1960s uh, and the 1970s. They all, all also uh, demonstrate the role that the McCarthy period and the post-World War II Red Scare played in breaking that labor uh, African-American left alliance, which appeared to be so powerful in the years uh, be, uh, be, before uh, World, World, War, uh, World War II. Uh, and uh, uh, the last observation I want to make is that the, uh, the, the papers also, I think, have a good deal to teach us about uh, ge uh, gender relations in the 1930s and 1940s on, on the left, and the role that women played within the Southern Negro Youth Congress, uh, which was, uh, in many respects, far more prominent at that time than it was a generation uh, uh, later. Esther has a lot to say about that in her oral history interview, but I'm not sure if we're going to have time to, uh, to, to play that, that portion. Uh, so to sum up, the Jackson Papers really do speak to many of the central questions uh, that we have all been wrestling with concerning the 20th century American left, the civil rights movement, and the, and the labor movement and their interrelations. Uh, they describe the culture of the movement, its interracial nature, and the reasons why so many uh, African Americans of James and Esther's generation uh, linked the struggle for black freedom to the struggle for socialism and communism. I believe that uh, this uh, collection will not only be of interest uh, to scholars, uh, who we hope will start uh, beating down the doors here to use the papers when they open uh, this winter, but also to the younger generation of activists who I think could learn uh, a, a, a good deal uh, uh, f uh, from from these uh, from these papers, I just want to sort of mention a few other other other, other aspects of, of, of the papers. Uh, as you all know, Esther was managing editor of Freedom Ways for its entire uh, 25 year histories, and in some respects, uh, the papers that we have here really are the archives of Freedom Ways. Uh, I don't think there is any formal archives of Freedom Ways, but we have the editorial correspondence, uh, the photographs, the, uh, the draft articles, uh, which really do get us uh, inside of, of, of Freedom Ways and remind us of its, uh, of, of, of its, of its, of its influence on that, uh, again, the, that, the generation of, 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 of the 1960s and 70s. And the other aspect of, of, of the papers that I want to close by mentioning, uh, James Jackson, as you all know, was an active Communist Party member for more than a half century. He was editor of the Daily Worker, taught at the People's School for Marxist Studies. We actually have uh, a wonderful uh, plaque there from the People's School that I brought uh, here this summer from uh, 23rd Street, and served as uh, uh, also International Affairs Secretary. And uh, uh, again, there's, in, I, I'm going to say recently, but actually this is 20, this is old news, 20 or 25 years. The role of African Americans in the Communist Party has been a subject that people have been considering now for at least a, ge a, a generation. And I think they will uh, find a, 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 a good deal uh, that, again, will, will, will shed an interesting perspective on. Uh, uh, on, on, on that uh, on that subject, uh, I guess before I I, I relinquish the uh, the microphone, the two people that have worked on very hard on the papers this past uh, th this this past year, uh, Stacy Patton, who I saw before, is in the audience. So you want to stand up, Stacy? Stacy actually worked with Esther for nearly a year. Uh, 
I, uh, I, I did the fun part. I spent a couple of afternoons in Esther and James's bedroom looking through the boxes and figuring out that this stuff was wonderful. Stacy actually did the hard work of organizing it and packing it up uh, and getting it shipped to Tavernant. And Peter Filardo, I thought him, uh, Peter Filardo took it over from Stacy uh, after it arrived at Tavernant and he, and, and, and he's been processing uh, uh, the, 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 the papers, uh, I guess, since the spring. And uh, much to my amazement, uh, they're almost ready for opening, far ahead of what I thought uh, was a reasonable schedule. Uh, I, I want to uh, bring Esther now up to the podium to talk to us for uh, you, you want to at least say, uh, I know, given what I said, I don't think we need to give her any further introduction, but if you just want to say a few words, or if you want to just turn on the mic and talk from where you are. Johnson. Is, uh, Timothy is here. Timothy, Timothy is uh, going to in introduce our keynote speaker. Timothy uh, Johnson uh, is my colleague here at NYU and the African American Studies uh, libra librarian. And he's really been my partner in organizing uh, this, this event. Uh, he, he organized uh, uh, one, of, one of the panels and has worked with me on every aspect, uh, large and small, in putting this uh, event 
together. Uh, Timothy is also known, the Jacksons, I think, since the early 1980s, uh, worked with James and, Jess, and, and Esther on a variety of uh, political uh, uh, projects, I think, studied, uh, studied with James in the early, in, in the, in the, in the early uh, 1980s. Uh, so I just want to say thank you uh, to Timothy, and uh, uh, he's going to come up and introduce our keynote speaker. Okay, I'm going to be uh, kind of brief because I know you all didn't canoe over here this morning to hear me speak. So, um, yeah, that's a privilege to introduce Professor Angela Davis. And let me in. I think it was around last year of, of November when they solidified getting the Jackson's papers and we started talking about some kind of way to commemorate that and we talked about an, a dinner honoring them which was held last night and then we also thought it would be good to organize some kind of a, a conference that would highlight some of the trends that people may want to use those papers in terms of doing their research and when we talked about trying to figure out who we would get to keynote, the obvious person that we thought would be Angela Davis because of so many of um, aspects of her background, of her political writing, of her political activism uh, fits with all of the elements that Jim and Esther's papers uh, will deal with. Uh, Professor Davis has a PhD in philosophy. She's a tenured professor in the Department of the History of Consciousness at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Some of the courses that she regularly teaches are culture and ideology, women of color, cultural and historical studies of race and ethnicity, critical theory in the Marxist tradition, and feminist theory. She's written a large number of books, which I'm soon many of you are familiar with. Uh, just a couple of them, Angela Davis, an autobiography, which was published about 30 years ago and is still in print. And if any of you know anything about the book trade, that's very unusual for a book to have been in print that long. Uh, Women, Race, and Class, uh, a book which maybe is not as read, but is very important, called Blues, Legacies, and Black Feminism. And there's a very interesting chapter on Billie Holiday and Strange Fruit that, if nothing else, everybody should read. And most recently, a book called Abolition Democracy. Uh, and then one other thing, there's an article that I think was published around 1969 in Black Scholar called Reflections on the Black Woman's Role in the Community of Slaves that has come to form part of one of the canonical works of what later become black feminist criticism and black feminist scholarship. And that's something that's still cited today and people still talk about the influence um, that it had. Um, last night at the dinner, David Lewis was introducing Angela and mentioned something about her kind of iconic status. And I thought that was odd because actually I was going to use the same word. Now, last night I said, okay, I got to think of another word now. Uh, but I thought it was interesting because that kind of and that kind of status and she is symbolic of a lot of things in the struggle for women's equality the struggle for African American equality uh, the struggle for general social progress but that kind of iconic status is really not based on what happened 30 years ago because there were a lot of other trials a lot of other people that were very well known 30 years ago but the reason she has attained that kind of status is what's happened in the intervening years, that she's continued to be in the forefront of speaking out on issues of social justice, of uh, racial equality, of women's equality, of not just prison reform, but the abolition of the prison structure, and all of these kinds of issues. And that's what makes her unique. Um, just as a postscript, in I guess it was over 30 years ago, then California Governor Ronald Reagan vowed that Angela Davis would never teach at the University of California. Uh, well, as I mentioned, she's now a tenured professor at the University of California. And in 1994, she received the distinguished honor of an appointment to the University of California Presidential Chair in African American and Feminist Studies. And as for Ronald Reagan, <laughs> you know, the uh, older people always say, try to speak good about the dead. 
Uh, and I think Mom's Maisley's comment was, he's dead good. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's uh, my pleasure. Please welcome Professor Angela Davis. Let me stop laughing. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is really a, a wonderful occasion, and uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to have been asked to deliver the, can everyone hear? As I was saying, it's a great honor to have been asked to deliver the opening remarks for the symposium on the occasion of the acquisition of the James and Esther Jackson archives by um, this institution, the Tannenant Library. Um, when Mike mentioned that we might have the opportunity to hear a portion of the interview uh, with uh, Esther that Robin Kelly conducted uh, some 20 years ago, if we have time, I started looking at my notes and I said, I better cut back uh, because I'm really anxious to hear the interview and I'm really interested in what you have to say about uh, gender issues during that period. Uh, so Mike, uh, I don't know where you are. Uh, Okay, well, no, I just wanted you, I wanted you to be the timekeeper. <laughs> um, let me begin by saying that uh, the, the papers will be in very good company here. Uh, sharing space with the papers of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Eugene Debs, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and now uh, we've learned the Communist Party and many other individuals and organizations and movements. This is, I believe, an extremely exciting occasion for researchers and activists who will have the opportunity to explore these archives and will discover an important dimension of the history of our country, the history of the left, the history of civil rights, of labor organizing, of anti-racist organizing, anti-war organizing, important dimensions that have um, gone, that have largely gone unrecorded. And so James and Esther Jackson have given us a magnificent legacy. So I would like to begin by making a few observations about our relationship to legacy, to the past, and our negotiations through what we um, call history, uh, which brings together different and sometimes conflicting temporalities. And I'd like to talk about our understandings of legacies. Legacy is generally defined in two ways. Uh, uh, one, a gift by will, especially of money or some personal property. Two, something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past. But in both instances, there is an assumption that somehow the past is securely segregated from the present. Of course, in law, the originator of the legacy must first die in order for it to be transmitted. Not all legacies, not all inheritances, of course, hail progress. And I'm interested... Um, and, and Tim, right now I'm teaching a course called Theories of Slavery, and I'm interested in the contemporary inheritances of slavery resulting from the fact that the 13th Amendment uh, of the Constitution in declaring that slavery and involuntary servitude were legally abolished didn't tell us exactly what was supposed to be abolished. That is to say, it doesn't tell us uh, uh, how slavery is defined. There is, of course, that exception which we know about that is made explicit, but even if we grant the exception and acknowledge that constitutionally convicted persons are still relegated to a form of civil death that's related to the social death of slavery, we still have not understood all of the inheritances of slavery. 
The 13th Amendment does not tell us what, what features precisely of slavery were to be abolished. Um, uh, a legal scholar, Gayora Bendis, uh, points out that it doesn't tell us whether it's abolishing slavery as human property, whether it's abolishing compulsory labor, corporal punishment, whether it's abolishing non-citizenship, whether it's abolishing social death or the, um, the um, not born status of the slave, uh, the lack of kinship ties, it doesn't tell us whether it's abolishing the race, the racism that enables slavery. Um, and of course we can see uh, capital punishment, for example, as a direct legacy of slavery that is still with us. Um, the project of abolition, which Du Bois so thoroughly discusses in Black Reconstruction, has not yet in the 21st century been fully accomplished. Now, let me talk a bit about legacies um, that are assumed to be a part of the um, dominant narrative of the history of this country. Uh, le legacies of triumph. Um, triumph over what are considered to be historical scars. Triumph over slavery. It is assumed that slavery has been abolished and we are uh, living uh, that abolition. We're living that aftermath. Uh, the genocide of Native Americans, segregation. Uh, uh, these dominant legacies are wrought by declaring that the offending set of practices is now dead. Slavery is dead, segregation is dead, racism is dead. And I'm actually thinking about the way Rosa Parks' legacy was uh, celebrated uh, uh, in the White House, uh, in the Capitol. You know, I'm thinking about what was required in order for her to become the first woman whose body uh, uh, was able to lie in state in the vestibule of the Capitol. Um, uh, and of course for uh, George Bush to declare the importance of this legacy to the not so much the ongoing struggle for democracy but to the triumph for democracy. Uh, the same democracy that is perhaps being uh, exported uh, uh, to other places by means of war. And, and in general, I think, the civil rights movement had to be declared dead in order for its legacies that are almost always individualized. Um, Tim was talking about icons, we should talk about the icon effect that has a dangerous impact on the way we imagine uh, radical movements. Um, not to speak of the Messiah effect, right? You know, we're always waiting for a leader who's uh, going to take us over the mountain. Uh, but in, in, in order for these legacies individualized in the figures of people like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Coretta Scott King, in order for them to be incorporated into a narrative um, about an unbroken um, quest for American uh, democracy, the activism had to be declared over dead. Now, there has been no attempt to assimilate the legacies of the Southern Negro Youth Congress into a narrative about U.S. democracy. Uh, no attempt to assimilate the legacies of the Communist Party into a narrative about U.S. democracy, uh, precisely because those legacies point to unfinished agendas of freedom. Um, 
because these legacies could never be made to justify the war on terror uh, because the Jacksons and their comrades fought for a freedom that could never be assimilated into a project of U.S. global do domination through war and torture and through the wholesale denial of civil rights and, and, and human rights. Um, and Esther just uh, showed me a, a photograph I have never seen of my mother. Uh, uh, it, was in, it was in the program, I believe, for the third All Southern Negro Youth Conference in Birmingham. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm actually, I'm feeling very moved. Uh, uh, I, I was wondering why I was asked to give the keynote address because there are scholars who know so much more than I do. Uh, and, and, uh, and then I, I said to myself, well, well maybe it's because uh, uh, the company here will consist of people I've known literally all of my life, uh, like the Jacksons, like Dorothy Burnham. And, um, but let me get back to my notes. I promised that uh, I would <laughs> not go over time so that we can hear the um, interview. The, the work of, uh, speaking of legacies, the work of W.E.B. Du Bois has just recently begun to be recognized in a broad uh, sense. Uh, uh, and of course, we have in part uh, David Levering Lewis to thank uh, for that. Uh, but I have to admit that I'm, I'm sometimes a bit disgusted, uh, uh, and I'm sure uh, 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 David Lewis has encountered similar situations when um, academics, sometimes white academics, who just learned about uh, the work of Du Bois, assume that no one else has been reading him, right? <laughs> that this is something that's totally new. <laughs> Uh, but of course, uh, if Du Bois's legacy is now being taken up uh, in a much broader context, there's still what we might call dangerous aspects of that legacy that, that continue to remain subjugated. Um, um, and there are a host of what we might call subjugated legacies associated with the lives and work of James and Esther Jackson, dangerous inheritances uh, uh, that might very well help us uh, um, challenge and perhaps triumph over the U.S. drive for global imp empire. Now, Michael was talking about uh, the way in which this archive may uh, radically transform how we think about the history of the civil rights movement. Uh, and I am in absolute agreement uh, with him. And I think that, um, well, you know, we, we, we always look for dates. Uh, to mark origins, uh, and so there are convenient dates. Uh, you know, sometimes there's the Brown v. Board of Education. Sometimes we use the date 1955 because of the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, 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 and then sometimes we use the date 1951 because of the genocide petition that Paul Robeson and William L. Patterson uh, uh, presented uh, to the United Nations. Um, and so it's, it's going to be important for us to think about the Southern Negro Youth Congress. As someone, I can't remember who said it, but uh, I, I've been, been, for the you know, last period, I've been reading all of the, you know, the things that I've been able to get a hold of, like uh, Esther Jackson's, uh, Esther Jackson's wonderful um, um, pamphlet uh, about Jack called This Is My Husband, Fighter for His People, Political uh, Refugee, and all kinds of other, you know, black power. It's just really exciting. Uh, remove the dagger from the heart of the Bill of Rights. Uh, philosophy of communism. But in any event, I ran across uh, a statement by someone who said, uh, uh, more recently, when I think SNCC, instead of thinking Southern, uh, 
um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I think seven Negro Youth Congress. Uh, so we have two SNCs. Uh, um, and the, what we might call the communist formation of those who worked with the Southern Negro Youth Congress, their formation both in the party and outside of the party. Um, that formation allowed them to think about the black freedom struggle in terms that were never limited to uh, the freedom that eventually came to be hailed as the triumph of the civil rights movement, uh, especially never limited to uh, the freedom that perhaps finds its most appropriate expression in the freedom of the capitalist market. Uh, 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 and for those who, who possess no capital, the freedom to sell one's labor power with all of the contradictions that that entails. Their aim was not to ensure that black people and other racially oppressed communities would only achieve a limited freedom before the law, the freedom to appear as individual abstract rights-bearing subjects before the law so that for example, the 2.2 million people who are currently in prison um, might be um, uh, justified, uh, their, their incarceration might be justified by the so-called equal treatment they all received, uh, and thus by the blindness of the law to any configuration of human beings except as individuals. And so the Jacksons and their comrades did not separate civil rights from labor rights. The freedom they wanted would entail vast revolutionary transformations. If, if Jim Jackson and the Southern Negro Youth Congress fought so hard for the unionization of tobacco workers, it was because they knew that people need to exercise collective rights and collective rights now, and they also need to see these collective rights as guaranteeing the right to struggle, not only for individual rights, but for revolutionary transformations for socialism. Their legacy could never be contained in the concepts that are now offered to us uh, as contemporary ways of addressing uh, uh, the problems, particularly with respect to uh, race and class and gender and perhaps sexuality that we confront. Uh, uh, there is this concept of diversity. Uh, and um, it, uh, while I know that uh, we use it when we are, because we're often compelled to, it, um, it is very distressing to me that this term has colonized so much of what we were once able to talk about capitalism. And I return to the more than 2.2 million people who are in prison. Now the U.S. incarcerates proportionately more people than any other country in the world. Yeah. Uh, I saw a, place my, a play my niece was in uh, on Thursday, and there was a wonderful line in which uh, a woman, a German woman, uh, is involved with this, uh, or sort of in a mood of black people or black men. She said, I want to be reincarcerated as a black man. <laughs> I thought I would share that with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if we consider the extent to which the institution of the prison has become a kind of symbol of the democracy the U.S. is offering to the world in the sense that um, the, uh, the military prisons, we think of Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, you know, but also the fact that U.S. style prisons are everywhere following uh, um, a structural readjustment and in countries in the southern region that are extremely poor you might see uh, areas where uh, uh, the, the, the housing is really not fit for human beings with extreme poverty but then right there you will see a shiny new sophisticated technologically developed prison as the solution for the um, 
dispensable populations that are created by uh, the influx of global capital. But I want to, uh, I, w I want to wind up now and um, uh, say that um, I really look forward to hearing all of the papers uh, today. Um, my relationship to the Jacksons is not a scholarly relationship, although it would have been. It would still be really fascinating to systematically discover their lives and writings and archives and organizing efforts, and this uh, made me uh, uh, look forward to doing more of that. Uh, uh, my relationship to the Jacksons is personal and political, and in thinking about my connection with them over the years, I realized that I can't undo the entanglement of the personal and the political. And as I said last night, I think this has probably been true for many of their friendships and relationships. Uh, uh, and I found uh, in, in this um, wonderful pamphlet uh, a... Um, uh, an excerpt from a letter that Esther quoted from, which was written from a letter from Jack, written on the stationery of the Tobacco Stemmers and Laborers Industrial Union, which Jack had had to help to organize at the export factory of the British American Tobacco Company in Richmond while Esther was still at Fisk, I believe. Is that right? Wait. Okay. Well, anyway, let me read, let me read the passage. Esther can correct me. <laughs> she can get the historical details uh, right. Uh, but this is such a, a, a wonderful uh, passage. Already, uh, Jack writes, I have missed the glorious Fisk hospitality, and most especially your contribution to the joyous stay I had there. <laughs> of all the happy... <laughs> <laughs> of all the happy memories of my trip, my acquaintance with you will stand out in bold outline. A native unselfishness, a will to serve and to sacrifice, an ardent devotion to our cause, symbolized in the youthful beauty of a charming lady. <laughs> Okay, um, Dash, and that's Esther to me. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I think about um, the extent to which Esther and Jack and you know, all of their friends and comrades, Dorothy Burnham, Louis Burnham, the Strongs, uh, uh, my mother was involved in, in the organizing of the uh, Southern Negro Youth Con I, I th uh, Congress. I think about the, the passion that was there. I think about the devotion, the way in which they took seriously what we might call the, the zeitgeist and quite literally seized the time with their organizing and political work. And as we know, both Esther and Jack gave up promising professional careers in order to devote themselves full-time to the revolution. And while they were not unique among their generation, I'm sure that their decision to become organizers inspired others. Uh, um, Young people today need to know that they can follow their passions and that they can be passionate about revolutionary change, about making the world a better place to inhabit. Uh, um, and I, I was going to talk about a few other things, but I think I'll just summarize. I, I wanted to talk about how um, Jim and, and Esther uh, were able to confront um, what we might call this seduction of black nationalism. And for many of us who were coming of age at that period of time, it was important to know that we could be passionately engaged with the struggle for black liberation and at the same time fight for the emancipation of the working class and oppress people uh, throughout the, the world. I had a section on personal memories and I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, 
Now, while I was thinking about this talk, I remembered Esther, when I came over um, uh, to visit you and Jack, when you were in the GDR, I was a student in, um, in Frankfurt in West Germany, and it was my first visit uh, to the GDR, and I think it was maybe, maybe it was Jack's birthday or something, yeah, yeah. And I also remember that time that, that I, uh, I went to a bookstore and I bought uh, as many of the collected volumes of, of Marx and Engels as I could uh, because uh, in, in the GDR you could get them for each volume cost about one mark each, uh, which was like 25 cents each. Uh, so I bought, I still have them, I bought like, uh, like 30 volumes, uh, including Capital, the three volumes of Capital and the theories of surplus value. Uh, um, but, yeah, finally, I must say um, some words about the importance of freedom ways. Uh, and because of the brilliance and perseverance of Esther Cooper Jackson, we have 25 years of this uh, amazing journal of culture and, and politics. And we have a chronicle not only of the movement for black liberation, but of so many aspects of our history which have fallen out of the dominant account. And so much that is there resonates with the current period. And again, I want to emphasize um, internationalism. Uh, which is what I think we most desperately need uh, uh, right now. And so let me um, conclude. I wanted to, to share this passage with you that uh, is included in the Freedom Ways Reader. I think it's the first, um, uh, the first article by W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, his uh, speech to a gathering of the Seven Negro Youth Congress in Columbia, South Carolina in 1946, almost, almost exactly 60 years ago, October 20th, 1946. And this was the final passage. There could be no more splendid vocation beckoning to the youth of the 20th century after the flat failures of white civilization, after the flamboyant establishment of an industrial system which creates poverty and the children of poverty which are ignorance and disease and crime, after the crazy boasting of a white culture that finally ended in wars which ruined civilization in the whole world, in the midst of allied peoples who have yelled about democracy and never practiced it, either in the British Empire or in the American Commonwealth or in South Carolina. Here is the chance, he said, for young women and young men of devotion to lift again the banner of humanity and to walk toward a civilization which will be free and intelligent, which will be healthy and unafraid and build in the world a culture led by black folk and joined by people of all colors and all races without poverty, without ignorance, without disease. Thank you.